Hello and welcome to the fourth meeting of the Turba Online Discussion Group on the history of alchemy broadly defined. I am Joe Hedison from University of Oxford, the organizer of the Turba, and I am very pleased to introduce today's session called Tria Prima, Experimenting with Material Transformation. The panel will present three experiments in material transformation undertaken by Tina Asposson, Tiana Uchatz, and Donna Bilak for the group uh, jewelry exhibition Ars Chemica, Alchemica, I should say, Ars Alchemica that took place in November 2021 in New York City. Before I begin, I will just say the very quick administrative matters to the best extent possible, if you can keep your video on and the sound off. I will be taking questions either in the chat or if you raise your hand virtually, I should be able to see you. And you can also ask questions, of course, on YouTube, uh, which you can write in the chat box and I will, I will get to those as well. Uh, the meetings are usually a maximum of one hour and a half. And I would like to say a special thank you, of course, to the Society for the History of Alchemy and Chemistry, which is providing its Zoom and YouTube account for our use. So first up, I will uh, let Donna uh, talk a little bit about the context of, of, our of today's panel. So uh, Donna, if you can please start, unmute yourself and start um, telling us what it is about. You got it. First of all, thank you so much, Joe. And uh, thank you to everyone for making time on your Friday, wherever in the world, you know, this uh, meeting happens to find you. Um, quick sort of note disclaimer before I launch into everything. I have four budgies. Maybe you can hear them. They're very excited and happy to be alive generally. So there's some random chirping in the background. It's just me. So, um, with that, uh, with that in place. Um, so let me first just tell you how we're going to structure today's talk, uh, just to give you an idea of uh, the timing and, and what's coming down the pike. I'm going to start off with a very brief introduction about what the Ars Alchemica Jewelry Exhibition is about. Um, uh, this basically details the collaboration between Tina, Tiana, and myself involving our participation in a group exhibition of contemporary jewelry, uh, which we called Ars Alchemica, that took place in November in New York City. Um, so that intro will be about five, seven minutes. Uh, then we three will each take about 10 minutes to talk about our respective contributions to this jewelry exhibition, namely, Tina will discuss her research into the transformation of iron into copper that was based on her archival research, which um, Tina and I reimagined into an interactive piece of jewelry, the dissolving copper vitriol ring. Uh, then after Tina, Tiana will take the helm. She'll talk about her research project about design transformations across media based on her work and exploration of early modern Netherlandish artisanal claims. And then I'll wrap things up with a look at how historically inflected artisanal processes in jewelry making establishes a relationship between, between the library and the laboratory and between humanities and industry. Uh, and then we'll just open up the floor for uh, questions and conversation. So, um, okay. Without further ado, I'm going to do share screen. And uh, I'm just going to put the web page up for Ars Alchemica, just in the background. Um, all right, Ars Alchemica. What the heck is Ars Alchemica? Well, this was actually the brainchild of my jewelry collaborator, Christiane Teague, um, to co curate a small group exhibition of contemporary jewelry that pushes the bodily and conceptual boundaries of matter in all forms. Um, this took place during New York City Jewelry Week, which runs every November and last year it happened to run between uh, the 15th and 21st. So Christiane and I conceived Ars Alchemica as a challenge to rethink relationships between the natural world, materials and their origins and human being. 
And our premise being alchemy presents the art of trans transformation through the manipulation of matter. This exhibition curated artisanal responses to the concept of alchemy as transformation in exploring ways that the medium of jewelry places the human built environment in dialogue with nature. And we invited jewelry creations that pushed the physical and conceptual boundaries of matter in all forms. So we asked the question, using, alchem using alchemy's universal language of material transformation, how might jewelry illuminate the world that we create through the things we do? Um, and we also held the exhibition at the Goldsmith Studio where I do my bench work, Jewelry Arts Inc., which is located in Midtown Manhattan. And for those of you that are familiar with the city, it's right in the heart of the jewelry district. Um, so let me actually take you into my, into my Google Drive. Welcome everyone into my Google Drive and let me, crap, how do I get rid of us? Okay. So uh, yeah, this is, uh, <laughs> this is Christiane and I um, uh, at the uh, start of the Els Alchemica show. And I just wanted to take you through a really quick tour of um, some photographic memories from this very memorable week. Uh, this is actually a shot of the Goldsmith's Nook. Uh, the studio is a working studio. So it was sort of um, in the spirit of a pop-up jewelry show. And we took over the Nook. This is one half of the space. And, and you can see um, uh, a participant just perusing some of the exhibitions or some of the exhibits rather. This is taken from the other side. This is actually a snap of uh, Tiana's work. Um, one of the uh, exhibition contributors was a former student of mine, Findlay McComb, and uh, a former NYU student of mine. I teach uh, a history of science course undergraduate seminar um, at NYU. And uh, Finn created a pair of earrings that um, featured capsules containing body paint that when they're pierced, um, uh, the earrings slowly drip paint onto the body. And this was conceived to be in dialogue with, um, with Tina's copper uh, dissolving, vitriol, dissolving copper vitriol ring. So here you can see the capsule filled with the body paint. On the, uh, on the model. And the idea is uh, that it's a statement about consumption and depletion of resources. And this way Finn uh, flipped the idea of the um, uh, jewelry as adornment to the body being adornment for the jewelry and the motion and movement of your body as the, plane, as the paint slowly releases um, the capsule slowly releases the paint capsule, it designs the uh, designs art upon your body. So the body becomes a canvas in this particular context. And these are examples of uh, the different capsules and colors that, uh, that Finn had created. And this was the, the uh, exhibit uh, section in the uh, jewelry studio. Um, Jeanette Keynes, who is the director of Jewelry Arts Inc. Uh, she was also an exhibitor in Ars Alchemica and um, Jeanette's a fantastic colleague. This is where she and I engage in experimental metalwork. And these earrings that Jeanette created feature uh, experimental alloys that uh, she's been working with um, in what we're calling apricot gold. So it's gold that has this incredible peaky peachy pinkish hue and uh, fusible high carat rose gold. So uh, these uh, ode to joy earrings as she calls them were also featured in Ars Alchemica. And um, another example of a contributor is Kaza Wang. And Kaza's earrings, um, Kaza, T Tiana and I met Kaza um, when he, uh, uh, he was on uh, the Making and Knowing project at Columbia University, and Kaza is a fantastic woodworking artisan. And uh, Kaza is also a collaborator with me on my jewelry startup project, and his contribution to Ars Alchemica 
was to make these artificial marble earrings. Um, they're made out of um, two different colors of resin. Well, three different colors of resin, actually. And he uh, mixed them and mottled them in order to create these, um, these earrings, which are actually created to be in dialogue with my contribution, which is these, um, uh, these earrings that I'll come to talk about um, when, it, uh, when it's my turn. So the uh, Ars Alchemica exhibition um, really was a place also for us to uh, experiment with reimagining our archival research. And this is where I invited Tiana and uh, Tina to be participants. Like, what does it look like to take our, our, our text-based research and reimagine it materially into jewelry forms? What new insights um, can we arrive at in doing so? So, um, that's how we ended up being participants here on, uh, on Joe's uh, Turba meeting. And with that, I'm now going to turn over the talk to Tina, but I believe that Joe first has an introduction about uh, Tina's work and scholarship first. Yes, thank you, uh, Donna, for that uh, very useful uh, st starting point and uh, for those amazing images. And I, I have quite a lot of questions about them, but uh, let's let's go one step at a time. Uh, so um, first, I will introduce this uh, our first speaker, Tina Asmussen. Um, so she is assistant professor of early modern mining history at the Ruhr University of Bochum, and head of the mining history research department of the German Mining Museum Bochum. Her research interests lie in mining and georesources as an environmental and economic history of knowledge. Um, Tina received her PhD from the University of Luzern uh, with a, a dissertation of, on Anatasius Kerhe, which was published in 2016 as Scientia Kircheriana, Die Fabrikation des Wissens by Athanasius Kerher. Her current book project has the working title, Subterranean Economies, Mining and Resource Cultures in Early Modern Europe, and we all look forward to it. She's the editor of the Renaissance Studies Special Issue, Cultural and Material Worlds of Mining in Early Modern Europe, and co-editor of the Earth Sciences History Special Issue on Early Modern Geological Agency. And Tina will be offering the talk with the very intriguing title, I was iron, I am copper, I will be gold. So Tina, if you would like to take over at this point. Yes. Thank you so much for your kind introduction and also for um, inviting us here. And this, sorry, presentation mode. Do you see the right screen now? So I can see the uh, I was iron title. Exactly. And that was also the title of the art piece that Donna and I created. So this poetic and a little bit also enigmatic title um, refers to these objects that you see here and on this slide. And the German Mining Museum has a wonderful collection of these um, cups and, 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 and vessels um, from the early modern mining um, region in, in Lower Hungary, Herrengrund, present-day Spania Dolina in Slovakia, and Neusol, um, present-day Banska Bistrica. Unfortunately, none of these objects that we can see um, here um, found their way in the permanent exhibition. In contrast um, to today's lack of interest in these fascinating objects, they were of high demand between 1600 and 1800 among travelers who visited the mines in Lower Hungary. So I will now start with these objects and um, the production process behind these objects. And then I will come to um, the, 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 the experiments or the product that Donna and I uh, created. So um, 
these objects were so popular because they were a product of a natural wonder. Um, the material transformation of iron into copper with the help of copper vitriol. And as I've said, this process was mainly done in from a whole, um, these objects came from, from a lower Hungary, Neusol and, and uh, Herrengrund. Here you see such an object again, a gilded copper bowl with a miner working on a galenite a specimen. And the artists at Neusol and Herrengrund produced not only these gilded copper bowls, but also cups, vessels, dishes, forks, knives, spoons, and also Hanstein. And here's a random selection of my image collection. And characteristics of these ob objects are the engraved sayings, which refer to the wonder of creation. So the transformation process of iron into copper by the, um, the so-called cement water. Cement water is a copper retro solution in which the iron is immersed. And this iron then is coated immediately with copper layer due to the iron exchange. I don't have to tell you this in that context, but I do it anyway. And or the iron corrodes and on the bottom um, is, a, is, a, is a copper um, yeah, mud um, built. And this is then smelted and copper is produced. This process was considered by many practitioners and scholars as proof of the possibility of producing gold from base metals as well. The saying and also the iconography of these objects clearly make an alchemical reference. For example, these objects, these, are these two objects that are in the German Mining Museum, the so-called Herrengrund or Tumler on the left side, and um, we see here a little silver figurine Mars um, on a pedestrian. And the, min, uh, the, the, the inscription refers to the alchemical process of combining iron into copper, Mars cum venere ligata. A second particularly elaborately designed object dates from the late 17th century, of which I unfortunately haven't a better photo, um, is a bakery showing Mars, Venus, Bacchus, and Sol in four oval medallions with the corresponding inscriptions on which the following is written. I give the translation. Mars was my first name known in all places. Now I have become through art a soft Venus, but sun has made me a beautiful dress and those who are thirsty, I water with grape juice, Bacchus. On the baker's lid is also written, iron I was, copper I am, silver I wear, gold covers me. So considering this alchemical language of material transformation, um, let's also have a look at the historical practices of um, producing copper from, um, from cement water. Because what is interesting, research has so far mostly dealt with these objects from a collection history point of view, or also from an art historical perspective, concentrating on the iconography or also on the sayings, um, but not so much combining like this design history and the art historical um, aspects with um, history of alchemy and also the history of economy. Um, and these objects are so interesting because they combine like designing, making and thinking and also how people thought about like this process um, and understood the transformation in the 16th and 17th century. The history of cement copper production is very old. It was already performed in China in the 11th century. And then especially in the 14th, since the 14th century in Europe, but also in the new world. In Europe, the already mentioned regions and lower Hungary um, stand out. Um, from Schmelnitz to Herrengrund and Neusol. Um, at least since the beginning of the 16th century and until the 19th century, lower Hungarian mining towns were engaged in copper cement production on a large scale. In Smolnik, water was artificially, artificially channeled into the mountain, which is very rich in pyrite. And then this water was collected in underground um, basins or containers. And sometimes um, the mine water was even additionally enriched with calcopyrite to make the solution even sharper. 
It then was pumped up from the mines and led into wooden throats or barrels in which scrap iron was stored. Ferdinando Luigi Massili integrated in the third volume of his Danube uh, um, study this map where you see like this underground um, basins where this water is collected and then pumped up. And so two or three times a week, the copper containing muddy mass or the copper muddy mass that formed at the bottom of the, these containers was removed and smelted. By this method, already in the 1520, Smolnik um, produced 40 tons of copper yearly. So due to the DMN's demand of um, iron for copper, cement copper production, scrap iron was collected and traded on large scale. Economically, the production of cement copper was promising because of it required little financial and human resources. So the process um, required neither additional energy in form of combustibles, except for the smelting process, nor a complex infrastructure, nor were there any special requirements on the quality of iron. The consequences for the environment and also for the human workers who had to deal with this sharp liquid, um, um, on the other hand, were quite severe. And I'm currently trying to find out more on the historical impact of this industry into the environment and um, contacting archaeologists um, in that region. For the history of alchemy, this copper cement production is particularly interesting because it gained a lot of attention in times of crisis of the European mining industry. industry. Hello? Oh. Since the material transformation of iron into copper um, is possible, um, there were many ways and also desires to improve this process. And in my, I, um, in my archival research, I found many documents or, um, in, of um, mining-related alchemy where iron and copper and the transformation of um, iron into copper was involved. So I began myself experimenting with this process while I was in Spain and found a, a box of um, copper vitriol specimens. And I was very surprised. And um, this is the specimens that I found. And this is the ring that um, Donna created um, with. Um, and, and I was very surprised that it was so easy um, to produce this um, copper vitriol. So I have to move forward. So the process um, is really fast. So we just experimented with them. And everybody who is a chemist who knows that, but for me, it was uh, something very new that it really um, is covering so quickly. And then after four, 24 hours, the corrosion is just very um, um, visible, and you see it here on the on the bottom is this uh, um, copper uh, mud, and I then uh, dry and um, extracted this copper. Uh, I dried it, and then put it into the smelter with the help of my uh, friend. Oh, yes, <laughs> the metal came out. And um, it was done with, by the help of Stephen Merkel, my, meta, my, my friend, the metallurgist um, at, the, at our laboratory in the German Mining Museum. And you see here, it's really a 99% copper that turned out from that. And so to go back, uh, the object that we produced with Donna, we tried to um, really to... Um, combine my archival research and Donna's artistic research in that ring and artis uh, artistically try to reproduce what is going to happen. That's the grande finale. I remember this well. 
So actually, Tina, do you want to stop that? Because I, I have the video with the, um, here, let me, let me take over. Mm -hmm. Oops, I almost left and I'll, I'll play it from, um, from our uh, Instagram so that you can hear the, so let me now go into share screen and all right. So here we go. And our vitriol ring, we have dissolved the copper vitriol. And yes. Okay. Hi, welcome to uh, the grand finale at Jewelry Arts for NYC Jewelry Week, the Arts Alchemica Show. This is the dissolving copper vitriol ring. We have dissolved the copper vitriol. Uh, the piece is called I Was Iron, I Am Copper, I Will Be Gold, based on Tina Asmussen's research, Mining Historian. Now, this began as steel. It looks like we have successfully transmuted the copper, and we have with us Alana Dukes for the grand unveiling of the ring, and we're going to see what we've actually produced. Oh, God. Oh, God. Okay, here we go. Whew. Oh, oh my god. god. Oh my oh god. My god. <laughs> and I think we can stop with the oh my god. Um but uh, yes. Tina, I'll I'll turn it back over to you. Hi. Exactly. To, uh, and that was actually the entire um the entire uh, experiment and also what we left out now that the drip of the day every day the the the, the specimen was then got a drip of water. And so it um, more and more, it, it was dissolved um, in, in, in water and then on the last day um, revealed. So that's- And the, uh, just very quickly, these are some of the uh, process shots. So um, this is the copper vitriol. Uh, this is the design that Tina and I collaborated on. Um, so the concept was to start with the ring uh, and then just slowly, uh, slowly drip it uh, across the, um, the five days of NYC Jewelry Week to see, you know, what sort of transformation we would affect. Uh, this is me uh, applying heat to the steel and bending it with vice grips in terms of making the ring. I, um, I opted for this uh, just very straightforward V-shape design with uh, 14 karat gold claws to hold one of these um, shapes, uh, one of these copper vitriol, uh, or vitriol pieces that uh, Tina sent me. She sent me a package. I'm sure we're both on a watch list somewhere. <laughs> and um, these were the drips of the day. So you could see that uh, water starts, to, one of the drips went viral and we had like 2000 views in like an hour. That was kind of amazing. You can see the water gets like more and more disgusting and, and dirty. So, I mean, just imagining this happening like on, on the environmental scale that Tina researches, like just the, the environmental history of this kind of process is, is very interesting and important to delve into. So um, I'll do stop share and I'll turn it back to Tina for any concluding comments. Yes, that 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 actually was the the entire um, the entire experiment, and it was um, yeah, and especially the relation of these objects to make them visible, like um, what they did to the environment, is something that we can really invest more in studying it and how to, it's not so easy um, by showing like these pieces of art and showing um, this um, beautifully designed and um, bling bling objects and Kunstkammer objects, then to um, come to the aspect of production and all aspects from, from labor to environmental pollution. That's actually what we also wanted to address um, with those, um, the, the work processes, and also then the, the thinking about this process, the alchemical um, relationship. Okay, thank, oh, yes, thank you. Uh, thank you, Tina, and thank you, Donna, for for that, those amazing images and for, for the commentary. 
Uh, I'm just wondering where that piece is, so and how much it will cost in the near future, together with the drawing as a you know kind of a manuscript, um, um, you know treasure of some kind. But uh, yeah, we'll we'll leave the question for later. For for now, I will. Uh, well, that is actually interesting, Joe, because Instagram then becomes an archive of this process. So it's a really interesting repurposing of social media. I'll leave it at that. Yeah, that's 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 a good, very good point. Um, so I will I will introduce Tiana now. Um, so next up is Tiana Uchats. I hope I pronounced the last name right, or well, somewhere near right. Uh, she's assistant professor um, in the Department of Visualization at the Texas A&M University. Uh, she's specializing in early modern craft, uh, early modern craft and uh, technology. Uchatz was a postdoctoral scholar from 2016 to 2020 at the Making and Knowing Project at Columbia University. She received her PhD from the University of Toronto in 2016 and has ha held fellowships at Utrecht University, Central Institute für Kunstgeschichte and Science History Institute. Tiana is co-editor of the award-winning Secrets of Craft and Nature in Renaissance France and of the upcoming Spaces of Early Modern Creative Labor. She has published in Renaissance Quarterly, ISIS, Berichte zur Wissenschaftsgeschichte, and Netherlands Kunsthistorisch Jahrbuch. Tiana's talk is entitled Transmuting Design and Remediating Knowledge, knowledge How, the Recipes for Ornament Then and Now. And Tiana, if you would like to take over, Thank you so much, Joe, and sorry for the mouthful of a um, of a title. Um, I'm super excited to share some of this material with you today. So let me start by actually making that happen. Share my screen. I'm hoping my title slide has come up for everybody. Yes, it's it's perfect. Thanks. Okay. Um, Donna briefly introduced um, my piece uh, that is uh, that was part of the exhibition in the fall, and I'm going to take you now through its context in a larger research project and how um, we arrived at it. So I've been working on this print series for some time now, which um, combines grotesque strap work, um, scroll work, garlands, fruit, hybrid beasts, um, and all sorts of bits and pieces of uh, grotesque ornament design as it was current in the late 16th century with here, strangely, passion prints. Um, there's lots to be said about this particular ornament series, but the thing I'm most interested in today is telling you about its title page. Um, now that title page, let's see, am I doing this correctly? Come on, Tiana, there we go. <laughs> that title page, um, makes an explicit address to the viewer, but it also makes a few really interesting claims about the utility of the print series that it introduces to the painter, to the sculptor, to the tapestry weaver, to the goldsmith by way of um, gilt silver work and um, the embroiderer. And I find myself um, asking, well, you know, is it really all that useful? And in fact, in one case, we know that it was useful to another type of artisan. So you see here a depiction on the left of the arrest of Christ, a little detail of it that zooms in on one of the soldiers um, and the translation of that soldier into the engraved design on a late 16th century cabas set. But more importantly, um, the artist and the publisher, Gerards and Sadler, are not the only ones to be making these claims about utility for ornament print series. And the more you kind of poke around, the more you see that there's a, a trend in, in some of these title pages. They've never been collected or treated as a corpus. And so I have a, a larger research project that is doing just that. Um, now, there are three characteristics that seem to be common to uh, these types of title pages. First, they repeatedly are addressed to both art lovers and artists. So referencing the collectors and um, maybe somebody who would have art artisanal use. Second, they seek authority for their respective print series by gesturing towards concepts from ancient rhetoric and contemporary art theory, such as abundance, variety, novelty, and free inventiveness in relation to the designs. 
Third, the title pages claim that the designs are useful for specific and often wildly divergent types of artisans. And the consistency of these three characteristics, I think, um, has lent scholars to treat these as really kind of formulaic, um, uh, you know, common tropes that were meant to sell more prints. Um, but I ask rather, well, what happens when we take them at face value? Um, what happens when we treat them as, say, the visual equivalents of recipes? So, Let's zoom out for a second and think a little bit about what it meant to be an artist in the, the later 16th century. And to get into that question and this notion of what I want to say is an expanded artist's brief, uh, we can look at something like the facade to Franz Floris's house, uh, Franz Floris being the leading painter in Antwerp. And there are a series of allegorical representations of um, virtues that were thought to be necessary for the painter. Um, and among them, are some usual suspects like labor and poetry and or a knowledge of poetry, for instance. But on the very right, above the double barrel arch door, double doors with the barrel arch on top of them, that likely led back to the workshop where Floris had a whole um, army of studio assistants, um, is this representation here on the right of industry. And on top of industry's head is, of course, an ambix. Um, and I think that. I mean, there's been plenty of ink spilled on this particular facade, but nobody yet has noticed this or has actually thought about the implications of this index of, um, you know, knowledge of material transformations and conceptual transformation for the early modern artist brief. If we had not been so stodgy in our <laughs> selective use of Vasari's lives, um, we might have noticed as art historians a little sooner that um, th this expanded artist brief is also embedded in the sections of Vasari's lives that are dedicated to um, techniques of making. Um, and of course, among the, the things that might be useful to um, the painter and, and other types of artists are of course the, the, the um, different techniques of design, foreshortening, perspective, et cetera, et cetera. Also here, um, different types of painting, the knowledge of different types of painting um, and paint media uh, supports. But also um, Vasari thinks that um, the artist should also have a knowledge of stucco work, uh, gilding, uh, glass mosaic, um, stone intarsia, wood intarsia, stained glass, uh, engraving, um, wood engraving in copper, engraving on wood, uh, different types of printmaking. And so there's a really um, kind of a broad notion of the kinds of skills that it takes to be a leading artist. In fact, this is a tabletop um, made in the Medici workshops in Florence that was designed by Vasari and executed by one of the lapidaries who was working there. So we know that Vasari is putting his money where his mouth is and actually um, designing for a variety of different media, not simply designing for uh, painting. And of course, we have other instances where printed designs have been translated into um, different media like this, uh, another instance of Pietro Dura here, um, a beautiful um, polychrome stone version of the original design after Hans Bull. Similarly, uh, this in the north of Europe, same kind of question about um, the importance of uh, thinking of affordances of materials and the transformation of design into different media, we have this monumental mantelpiece to Charles V, and it is designed by the leading city painter in Bruges, uh, Lancelot Blondel, and he takes a, a trip to Ghent to meet with um, the carvers who are going to actually execute his designs to see if his virtuosic, grotesque, um, and almost carved in the round designs can actually be done in oak um, as was intended. So there's this, this documented conversation going on about um, the material exigencies of the project. And of course, um, in our own experience on the Making and Knowing project, the idea of um, material affordances and um, kind of quick and dirty tricks of taking something like um, rye flour or chalk and transforming them into um, an impromptu stucco gives a sense of the kind of material experimentation, but also um, the, the expanded notion of, of uh, artist materials that one particular uh, practitioner might be um, playing with. And um, similarly, the idea of um, using compressed paper pulp um, uh, this actually would turn out to be quite influential for my own um, 
foray into trying to think about how designs, these paper designs, these designs on paper might actually be translated into paper uh, in the exhibition that um, Donna co-organized in the fall. This project of mine to look at the transformation of design across various media um, is kind of rooted in two parallel um, methodologies of hands-on work. One is the advent of critical making, um, which often um, is much more contemporary and based on socio-technical kinds of questions. But really, I'm, I'm interested in it for the way that it pulls on creative, physical, and conceptual exploration um, and emphasizes shared acts of making um, and where the prototypes are not meant to be displayed, though here they were, <laughs> but they're meant to be a means to an end. Um, so they're, they're not the end in themselves. Um, and in this way, uh, critical making has some obvious parallels to other hands-on methods like the RRR methods, variously defined, um, but though those methods tend to be concerned with a slightly different, though again, parallel um, set of questions here about um, truthfulness and accuracy of the, the reconstructed object um, and a, attention to process, performance and documentation. So though both of these methods share and privilege experiences of making over acts of interpretation or experience of making as acts of interpretation, um, there's really a kind of distinct set of, of um, approaches that I, and I want to ask whether or not um, there's a way to kind of draw on both. So to draw on both group experience and reflection and this notion of rapid prototyping as a way to break open a conceptual field on the one hand and the ability to still answer historical question and to access embodied and tacit knowledge here of the early modern artisan on the other. So I'm really asking, is this a thing? <laughs> um, and so to get at that, um, we decided to focus on the question of undocumented intermediary transformations that might be necessary to actually take ornament print designs into a different medium. Here again, into carton, following the recipe um, that the Making and Knowing project had reconstructed before. So I've taken elements from one and the same print um, in order to be able to then uh, trace them into a um, coherent digital outline, um, decided on four levels of, of depth extrusion and then fed the file and transformed it yet again in, into a new file type in Rhino that we could then use to 3D print a mold into which I could then compress um, the, uh, the paper pulp following the carton recipe. Um, and here then I just molded them against some small tiny beer glasses that I had in my kitchen uh, to try to bring them closer to a, a bracelet sense, but um, also just kind of showing the, the outputs as, as strips themselves and the mold. And really the, the, this was but a, a first foray into the, the kind of, again, breaking open of that conceptual field and, and trying to figure out what the leading questions might be in order to help us test the claims of these ornament prints, um, to understand design for translation and translation of design across media. Um, and then recentering the marginal art of ornament, expanding that notion of the early modern artist's brief, um, and within the, the rubric of a much larger project that is going to be um, inviting expert makers to come and perform um, historical or, or reconstructions or translations rather of these ornament prints according to historical um, recipes with uh, to whatever degree possible um, historically relevant tools and to try to think through some of those questions of tacit knowledge. Um, what if, if the rest, if the, the ornament print itself actually could be the visual cognate of a, of a recipe, then what are the steps that are missing? What is the, the implied audience for this? Um, again, what are those intermediary steps um, and all of the, the kind of messiness um, of material and design transformation? All right, I'll stop there. Well, th thank you, Tiana, for, for that wonderful presentation. And um, we, I, I can't wait for the question time. Uh, but in the meantime, uh, I will uh, allow Donna to talk about her presentation on Prima Materia, Jewelry and Alchemy. And let me just introduce her for a moment. Uh, Donna is a historian of early modern science and a goldsmith. Her research encompasses early modern alchemy and jewelry, 
as environmental history. Donna currently directs the interdisciplinary project Golden Mercury Amalgamated Histories in Chemistry, Culture and Environment, which is forthcoming in 2023 as an ambic special issue. This examines ways these two interrelated metals have reshaped bodies, cultures, and landscapes in their transit through time and, and place. Uh, the gold and mercury project also informs Donna's views on being a humanities trainer, maker, seeking to articulate the connection between humanities research and artisanal practice, and through this to industry, a premise taken out for a dress drive with her jewelry startup, Prima Materia. Donna is also committed to open access publication, having uh, co-edited the Furnace and Fugue, a digital edition of Mikhail Meyer's Atalanta Fugians of 1618 with scholarly commentary with Tara Numadal. This, was, uh, this is available through University of Virginia Press online. Uh, and um, perhaps Donna can, can share the link at some point, uh, maybe via the chat. Uh, the book is a Dearborn digital publication and features the multidisciplinary community of scholars and performers that Donna created in 2013-2014 as a Science History Institute research fellow. So without much further ado, Donna, if you could uh, make your presentation. I will indeed, thank you. Um, okay, so we're going to take a little bit of a left turn in terms of how history research um, undergoes material transformation. Uh, let me do share screen again. Okay, so here we are. Um, so with Arzel Chemica, the group jewelry exhibition that uh, I co-curated back in November, um, clearly, you know, this little pop-up featured a wide ranging, um, featured wide ranging intellectual and artisanal identities. It featured students, scientists, artists, and scholars. Um, Arzel Chemica was also the venue for the soft launch of my, of my jewelry startup, Prima Materia. And I'll take you to this website. Um, thankfully, my copy does a lot of the heavy lifting for explaining what Prima Materia is. So I can just gloss and give you some highlights. But um, it's important to map out the genesis of this jewelry startup because it's inextricably entwined with who I am as a scholar. Um, before I became a historian, I was trained as a bench jeweler in Toronto's industry. I have a professional diploma in jewelry arts, and I worked professionally in Toronto's industry in the 90s as um, a, wax, a jewelry wax model maker and designer. And a series of um, unpredictable left-hand turns from life uh, led me to undertake graduate studies. I did my master's in environmental history, early modern environmental history, which then became the gateway to pursue a PhD, which led me to alchemy. And these are things that, <laughs> these are life decisions and career choices that your high school guidance counselor simply cannot map out for you. But this is what happens when you follow intuition and in addition to the, the challenges that life throws at you, these all turn out to be, in the alchemical sense, um, stages in transformation that, um, that have led me actually to now at this point, combining who I am as a humanities trained scholar with who I am as a goldsmith and having the two interface. So um, how Prima Materia came into being was uh, prompted by an invitation from Bruce Moran to be a guest editor for Ambix. And, you know, we had beers back in July 2019 before the world went all pear-shaped at the um, HSS Utrecht meeting. And um, I thought about it and I had at that point started to get back into jewelry making because I was also a postdoc on Pamela's Making and Knowing Project. And I had actually been brought 
into the project from my studio background, my jewelry studio background. And uh, my inner goldsmith had become awakened, you know, uh, during my years on, on M&K. So with Bruce's invitation to do a special issue, um, I really, I was prompted by questions that had begun to emerge at the jeweler's bench for me around um, the unavailability of mercury-free gold. Um, I'm, during Q&A, you know, I can take a deeper dive into this issue, but essentially artisanal and small scale gold mining activity is responsible for over 30% of the global mercury toxic assets in the jewelry industry has um, a tremendous responsibility in um, addressing this uh, humanitarian and environmental crisis. So as a goldsmith uh, and a humanities scholar wanting to use this mercury free gold and it not being available, probing why immediately reveals a Gordian knot. And this became the premise for the gold and mercury project where um, I pulled together a group of, of scholars from STS, anthropology, history of science, environmental history, to explore the transit of these two entwined metals as they move through um, as they move through time and culture, and how how this has really shaped and reshaped the world around us for millennium. So, um, prima materia uh, emerged from from these conversations, and um, I'm just going to pop over to the to my philosophy page because. As I was thinking through the Golden Mercury project, I was taking a lot of walks in my local park, Fort Tryon. And I was also talking with a lot of environmental historians and rethinking you know, how the human built world is reliant on resource extraction in ways in which this both converses and collides with the natural world around us. And I'm walking through the park and I'm looking at the pathways that are like shunting me through curating my experience of nature in the city. And I'm seeing this cracked pavement. And as I'm conceiving of the Golden Mercury Project, as I'm thinking and rethinking like the human built world in the natural world and my place in it, um, I'm realizing that these cracks are beautiful. These cracks in the pavement are beautiful. Um, there's nothing random about them. There are tree roots pressing up, weather pressing down, people, dogs, parks and rec vehicles traversing across. And there's a universal language encoded in these cracks. And they, for me, epitomize the, uh, the relationship of uh, humans with both industry and nature, the natural world. So I abstract jewelry patterns from these cracks that I see on the uh, from the pavement and I place them on the human body. So um, Prima Materia is uh, that's one the, that's the design thesis behind Prima Materia and where material transformations really comes into play is my position on gold. We have a hugely problematic relationship with gold as humans. We desire it, we love it. It captures our imagination like no other metal. Yet this metal has transformed our world as profoundly, as significantly as has sugar, oil, tobacco. And our relationship with gold has, um, across the millennia, has contributed to the Anthropocene. And I'm now starting to see jewelry as environmental history. We think of jewelry in terms of uh, material culture studies. We think of jewelry through the lenses of archaeology or anthropology or fashion studies. I think we need to understand jewelry in terms of its environmental transformation across time, across cultures that engage with gold. Not every culture engages with gold, but those that do have... Um... Anyway, um... Sorry, Tiana, I was about to go down a typical Donna rabbit hole and I cut myself. <laughs> so uh, back to how I use gold. I, I really take issue with industry conditioning of gold in relation to purity, value in relation to purity. We are conditioned by industry to appreciate gold in terms of 14 karat or higher. 
And historically, many civilizations, many cultures have worked in so-called lower carat golds because chemically it's more interesting. Um, the seven to 10 carat range uh, enables types of patination that extend the artisanal palette in terms of Japanese shakudo or depletion gilding, uh, which is a way of immersing the, the gold into an acid bath that corrodes away the surface alloy to leave an enriched gold surface. There's Mesoamericans practice this, um, as did the Romans, as did the Castellani in the 19th century with their archaeological revival style jewelry, as do I today in practicing my modern alchemy. Um, so I work in the seven to 10 carat range, but I also mix it with higher carats because every alloy has its particular property. And that's the, that's the purpose of an alloy is to mix different types of metals together with gold in, in, and render them molten so that they intermingle. And it's in pouring that molten gold, um, into, uh, uh, I have an excellent picture of doing exactly that. Um, alloying the gold um, and pouring it into an ingot, that's where you, you create a new metal with new properties. So um, Prima Materia plays with, um, plays with, this, uh, with this gold, with this seven karat gold. And um, I do so because I think it's very important that's my position on sustainability, to produce less um, more, more meaningfully and to, um, to get us to rethink our relationship with this material. Gold is my North Star. Uh, I'm using a gold, a metal that has wrought extensive damage to our world for millennia. And I want to use it as a material um, that can help to restore our damaged world. And Prima Materia in connection with the Golden Mercury project takes this concept out uh, for a test drive, both as a jewelry startup in terms of um, uh, how humanities can interface with both consumers and um, industry. And also from the academic side, how can we take our research findings and integrate them with ways in which industry is seeking to resolve issues around sustainability. Uh, we are the missing link for industry. And frankly, working with industry is the missing link for humanities. And um, I think on that provocative note, I'll open the floor up for questions. Thank you everybody for listening to us, appreciate it. Well, thank you all, all of you for this very exciting pro, exciting set of presentations, which was, um, well, they were very inspiring. I mean, both visually uh, in terms of uh, what you had to convey and also in terms of um, where it leads to. So, um, I mean, I will start, uh, I will of course invite all the questions the, that you can possibly pose within a half an hour. But um, I would like to start by just asking, well, I mean, you, you call this tria prima, and of course, in, in my mind, there was a Paracelsian connection to this. Um, and I couldn't help uh, actually uh, seeing those Paracelsian connections. Maybe it's just my, my Paracelsian mind acting up here, but... Uh, um, I, I was uh, immediately when I obviously when Tina was talking, I was thinking that uh, the uh, uh, that Paracelsus used a lot the the idea of uh, iron transmuting into copper as a, as a proof of the natural alchemy uh, that there exists such a thing as a natural alchemy, um, and of course with Donna I was I don't know why but I, I, I it it occurred to me that this whole idea of seeing. Uh, um, cracks in the pavement sounds a bit like, uh, you know, the, the art of signatures in, in Paracelsus. Uh, and maybe I'm imagining things, but... Um, Tiana I, forbade me to call my jewelry line cracks. <laughs> <laughs> well, 
<laughs> yeah, but it, it, do, it does sound, there is a certain <laughs> attraction to it. And I, I was just wondering whether uh, when, when you see the cracks, actually you, you see some kind of patterns to the cracks at all, or you, you, you try not to. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering whether you, you see yourself as, as working in this kind of line of natural alchemy of something that is happening naturally in nature uh, and uh, seeing yourself in, you know, in the traditional terms as, as an alchemist, as, as being basically a, a follower of nature, of, uh, uh, let's say, an imitator of nature, or, or you see yourself more like a Promethean, let's say, um, uh, artisan who might, might, um, might create something different than nature would do. Um, I'll, I'll just open it up to, to, to your, your thoughts. Uh, all of that's, you on this. that's a that's a thought provoking question. I hadn't thought about myself in uh, in Promethean terms, no. But um, I I mean, alchemy is the art of transformation. It's uh, it's for me. It's it's become a, a philosophy, a practice, a way of of actually understanding. <sighs> the stages that I move through life and how challenges and experiences uh, shape and reshape me according to how I respond to them, the decisions that I make. That's also a form of alchemy. Um, as, a, as an artist, um, and I'm only very recently assuming that mantle, not nah, that's the wrong way of saying it, understanding myself as an artist. I ran away from the idea of myself as an artist in my 20s. And I, uh, I pushed jewelry so far away from me because of, you know, uh, changes in technology that were happening in the 90s that I found very overwhelming and intimidating, frankly. And that actually, the transfer, the digital transformation that took me unawares in my 20s is in fact one of the driving forces that pushed me into becoming a historian, into entering into the archive. This connection with materials and, and texts is deeply embedded in me. And then coming out the other side and reconnecting with my artisanal self through the Making and Knowing project, and also having become a historian of early modern alchemy in this period and really understanding in different ways, both from the practical theoretical side as well as the emblematic side, um, these deeper meanings of alchemy and material manipulation and revelation, the ideas of concealing and revealing. Okay, so that's teeing up to answering your question. I, I understand what I'm doing as remaking making. I think that we need to rethink our concepts of how we produce things and doing so in a historically inflected way can actually make us as historians and custodians, if you will, of these, this knowledge of past practices and technologies and bring them to bear in addressing the present uh, issues and questions around sustainability that industry and society is grappling with. So in that sense, I'm also talking about uh, a conceptual alchemy as well. This transformation of attitudes and also transformation of attitudes of ourselves as historians and humanists and what we have to bear, how we can be impactful with the things we do, the things we know and bring them to bear into, uh, into the present. I'll stop there. Yes, I would also love to add on that because on the Paracelsian and from a less um, biographical um, um, point of view, but also from the history of mining, like from my personally, um, looking from the perspective of alchemy and human um art nature relationship on the history of mining opens a completely new perspective because um, mining history and historiography, historiography um, was um, 
often a very technological thing. So um, that opens from the 16th century uh, onwards, uh, like the way to uh, to capitalism, to industrialization that like really set nature like um, in contrast, like to technology and a challenge and ant uh, uh, agonistic way of dealing with nature, like conquering domination. And then um, Paracelsus also comes into play. And, and then when we also look at the um, metallogenesis and like the, the, the connections um, from the, the cosmological connections between the underground and the surface or the metallic generation and the influence of the planets, then we see it in, in, in different terms, like um, this uh, more an entangled history. And so um, in this project and also with the copper cementation, it's really interesting like, to see not just the soils and the rocks, but also the souls and the spirits um, that's something and not just technology, but also like like the the the, the, the organic. Um, um, that's um, the answer to this question. And then also how um, to see like um, drivers of um, yeah, technology and mining like Georg Agricola and um, of metallurgy like Lazarus Erke in a slightly different way um, by reading them with, um, with um, neoplatonic and but also with uh, a chemical um, background. Uh, I'm wondering, uh, before I take Tilmog's question, if uh, Tiana, would, would you like to comment on, uh, on, on this aspect, on uh, whether you see yourself as following kind of, well, are you an imitator of nature or are you a Promethean? <laughs> that, I guess that's the, 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 the big question. I think uh, I'm going to punt that question and we'll, we'll let Tilman ask his. All right, thank you very much. Um, well, Tiana, you, you, you're not entirely getting off because my question sort of um, follows on from that. First of all, thank you, uh, all three of you. Those were all wonderful um, presentations and, you know, so different and yet talking, um, speaking to, uh, to such important common themes. So, so my question um, is what more you can say about the relationship between the practitioner and the material, specifically in, in terms of agency, you know, you know, we know from making and knowing uh, and, and other things that the, the early modern view um, is sort of often one where the material is this active principle that can sort of be quite stroppy and not easily submit to what the artisan is trying to do and sort of work back um, at them. Uh, and so I was wondering what, what you could if you could say any more uh, about that in your work, because you know, with with Tina's presentation, it, it struck me that it, it's such a um, a story of sort of extraction. You know, you pump in this water, you get out the solution, and then, you know, um, how do people at the time think about that as something that is being done unto nature? It, does nature have any agency in that? Um, and then with um, Tiano's talk. Um, you know, we, we've talked a lot about making and knowing and making impressions uh, and, and the way that, you know, you can use that mold and you're sort of really imposing a form on matter um, in your own experience or in, in your historical source. Is there any discussion about the, the, the matter sort of, you know, working back against um, that idea that it's, you know, literally being, being pressed into a mold? Um, and, and that sort of contrasts with Donna's approach that has sort of this lovely softness to it in terms of seeing cracks that have formed through the interaction of you know humans and materials and the weather and nature and so on and taking that as inspiration um which is sort of you know the 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 opposite of sort of trying to trying to impose something so, so what what's the agency there that is um distributed be between the materials and the practitioner I, I, I can at least answer that for my part. I think part of the, the kind of interest in, in rapid prototyping and using an anachronism like um, a 3D printed mold, um, which was you know, complicated in its own learning processes to, to actually um, you know, 
um, in some ways it might have been a little bit simpler to to grab um, a, a more easily carvable material um, and try things by hand. But it actually brought up some really interesting points about what the you know with something like carton what the um, what the affordances were in terms of um, picking up really sharp edges or um, narrowly defined spaces, right? And and of the and actually of delaminating when I pulled it out, the more I would compress it um, to try and pick up some of that detail, which was you know at very kind of shallow registers. Um, then pulling the carton out again, there were times where the the layers of pulp began to, to so um, to to push back and not allow me to actually have put that much force and to pull out from the mold as I had thusly made it right. And so there's this this is kind of opening up for me the kind of questions around. Um, how to build a mold that could actually accommodate that um, type of work. Now, as for whether or not my sources speak to this, I think um, cheekily no, because I have prints that don't talk at all other than to claim utility. Um, and I think if if there's going to be anything, it's going to be in the, the negotiation um, with expert makers as they kind of think through what those intermediary steps are going to be and where they anticipate pushback and also in collating across historical recipes as inspiration where there might be um, small and, and hitherto unperceived kind of um, intimations of pushback. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping to run into it, but, um, but we're not there yet. Because it transfers to so many different materials with potentially the same sort of Right. Mold. Like, yeah, fantastic. Yeah. Or doesn't. <laughs> my answer is super quick, um, and it's a really compelling question, Tillman. But my whole premise has become, what does my thinking look like when I'm not trying to come up with an answer? What does my art look like when I'm not trying to imp in impose a preconceived form onto the piece and rather letting the piece shape itself? And what I mean by that is with the earrings, for example, that I've made, I've left the, uh, the maker's marks on them, the forge marks, the saw marks, they, they've become part of this, what my friend Andrew Lacey, uh, archaeometallurgist and sculptor calls an embodied signature, the artist's embodied signature. So in, um, in having a general sense of the direction I want to go in, but then as I'm working with the materials and ways that the metal wants to go reveals itself to me and going with that instead of trying to redirect it into what I want it to become that's been transformative in terms of my thinking and making yes and also thanks um Tillman for that question and also what you what you mentioned that massive intervention into the the environment by mining and how um early modernists perceived that and um and also uh, if nature then has an agency and that's pretty at the heart of what i'm um understanding and what i'm uh, what is um i'm in, in about in my research because it's um super interesting that that the early modernists like in the 16th century and in the 17th century they understood like um, this redesign of, of the landscape and into a resource landscape and into a mining landscape, not as something that uh, uh, as, as actually as positive, because um, you create like wasteland into a fruitful land. And it's often like that rhetoric of creating land where formerly was like um, a wilderness or um, an, an, an unruly landscape and make it pleasant. But on the other hand, it's also always the danger like of over exploitation and the sources really address that and what it's not like just the only uh, a human promethean issue because as soon as we expand like uh, looking at um the, the infrastructure that was created. Um, I currently um, just applied for, uh, applied for a, um, a project on, 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 on um, mining riverscape that looks at the infrastructure and the redesign of the water cycles and what that is made with the, like early modern floodplains in relation then in the little ice age and um, with um, high waters and uh, like when, when nature then gets feral again and the impact on society and how then they re reacted on that. And then it's really interesting to, to, to read um, 
prayers, um, mining prayers, but also the the, the lores, the um, vernacular uh, mining lores. They often are really interesting when, when reading them in the light of environmental transformation um, when uh, like so, or myth this, how Saturn acts in the world or the wild man or Rübezahl. Um, they, these um, are really interesting that are formerly like um, were understood in a, in a perspective of the German called Volkskunde only, but it's also interesting to read them in the perspective like of environmental transformation and what does it has done um, to people's minds and how they perceived uh, nature and also um, what kind of agency they thought nature had and the impact. Thanks. Well, thank you all of you for, for this very thoughtful um, answers. Um, and uh, well, which raised a lot of questions in my mind, but I'm, I'm mindful of the time. So uh, I would like to give other people the opportunity to, to ask questions if they like. So uh, first up uh, is Kim. Kim, would you like to unmute yourself and ask the question? I can't hear anything right now. Can yeah, anyone? me either. Um, Kim, uh, are you are you hearing this or? Um, well, I mean, we can um, take other questions, and maybe in the meantime, she can uh, she can unmute herself, and maybe you can take her hers afterwards. Um, I mean, for for me, you know, when 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 Donna was speaking, I was just having that. I mean, and I'm sure. The, that uh, Donna has somewhere in the back of her mind that image from from Mikhail Meyer of the uh, uh, you know of the alchemist kind of following the footsteps of nature and uh, and kind of uh, uh, well div divinating them in a way uh, you know kind of trying to figure out what what uh, what nature is up to and it's trying to to um, um, uh, trying to well, basically follow it as much as possible. Uh, and of course, with Tina, I was, I was thinking that uh, obviously, you know, when, when you think about mining and all that, uh, all those discussions during this period of time, obviously mining is pointed out as, you know, kind of this destroyer of nature in, in a lot of writings, you know, from, from the, um, the tradition of Pliny onwards. Um, and it, it is interesting how we know, of course, there was this kind of reshaping of the argument that, you know, we're, we're actually making, um, you know, something useful. We're, we're, we're improving on nature where, where nature fails in, in some way. And this is the, the interesting part to uh, how this, you know, there, there is this kind of um, dual uh, aspect to, to mining as well. Um, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I don't know if you, if you want to have a comment on that because uh, Kim is saying he, she's having some trouble connecting. So um, I, I just, I, I'm just very uh, interested in, in the way, um, you know, the early moderns would justify, you know, think, doing things like that to the environment while um, at the same time, uh, I mean, they, they were obviously aware uh, that uh, some of the rhetoric was, not, was, you know, against this kind of uh, uh, direct manipulation of the environment. But at the same time, the, yeah, you could make the argument that you're improving it in some way. So. But that, that's going on today. I mean, this is something that Tina can absolutely speak to because she's now engaged with the past, present and future of mining. But mining is like resource extraction is one of the most important technologies that we as humans engage in. And it's remarkable to me that we are the only species that has through this activity actually evolved out of our natural habitat. We've reshaped the world around us, not just topographically, but underneath. And everything that we pull out in order to remake, in order to support the ever increasingly complex systems that support our societies is, um, is part of an ongoing transformation. 
Um, I mean, I think Tina's work is so fascinating because it gets us to rethink early modern mining and metallurgy as also as environmental degradation. And those are really important questions to integrate into, um, into the historical canon. I'll stop. Yes, I, I cannot like add more on that because that was really precisely the answer because I think it we are not the first one to have this environmental reflexivity and are not doing something <laughs> better today than like um, consuming massive resources, even with, uh, yeah, e-electricity, um, with the, the issue of, um, uh, of, of um, cobalt mining and et cetera, et cetera. And so the early modernists um, thought also about like my, that, but that was difficult. They did not perceive mining. Uh, so at least in the 16th and 17th century as something anorganic, like Mumford understood it, like this inorganic um, mine underground that like really pollutes um, the uh, above ground and the surface. It was something organic was in relation like with agriculture that creates um, and creates um, a living and creates like um, 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 and um, does um, give um, people employment, um, education, all these arguments come up and come up again. But on the other hand, always like also like these um, environmental degradations and also um, legal cases against um, for farmers, against miners, because their, their livestock is dying. Um, yeah, they're polluting the environment. So this ambivalence is um, um, clearly there. Um, but I, I also have to throw this in too, like ways in which artisanal practice has polluted the environment, particularly around gold and mercury. Mm -hmm. Versailles, somebody needs to do an environmental history of Versailles. That is a testament to mercury gold amalgamation techniques through all of the gilded everything that went into adorning just this one palace. The golden onion domes, for example, that uh, are iconic in um, Slavic Orthodox um, architecture, church architecture. I mean, all of those onion domes were, were released how many toxic tons of mercury into the atmosphere, how many artisans were um, died of neurotoxins through exposure to mercury. Like we really need to start asking critical questions about the things that we study from one aspect as, of, of being a, a humanities scholar and, and start probing deeper into um, not just the form, but the meaning. I, I will say that, um, well, Kim is saying that um, she, she was very inspired by, by your presentation and that she's, uh, She's an artisan herself, and she's replicating costumes made of rubber, foam, and sometimes resin. Um, and uh, she just wanted to say that these studies have given her a newfound appreciation and perspective, uh, and she will will uh, help into they will help integrate it into her methods. Um, and uh, I was wondering if. Peter, you would like to say something because um, I, I noticed you 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 put a comment in the in the chat and um, whether you you would like to uh, to make a remark uh, if you can unmute yourself and then uh, we'll. Thanks very much, Joe. Um, sorry, I'm sitting in a very dark room, so all you'll see is just a, a silhouette. If it if I go to all the uh, video, um, just well, the image for... is fine. So it's... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, th thanks very much to or, to see all the speakers today. I, I say for me, it's been a bit of a dream seminar on the basis that um, I work on ethical gold certification and mercury comes into that as a sure our speakers know but possibly some of the other folk here don't um and also on mining heritage uh, there's some huge crossover with some of the things that are happening in cornwall in terms of the what was coming up that i'd, I'd love to talk to you about at some point tina so 
um, pl please get in touch. Um, but I think, yeah, it, the, actually that general comment about the past being incredibly important in the future, um, you see that this whole issue about Mercury turning up, uh, and I, I could flag other comments about the Mercury from the 19th century in Alaska now being released due to global warming. Uh, and you know, part of these things about the gold rushes and also going back to the 16th century about the fact that mercury was phenomenally important for the uh, Spanish Empire in terms of uh, actually getting the gold out of uh, Latin America and the issues that are still there today in terms of the mercury mines in Spain. I could go on and on. It was just a great, great day. So I won't spoil it by rattling on about odd things. Thanks very much to both of you. And thanks very much for the day. Well, I'm mindful of the time. So uh, please, John, would, would you like to ask your question? Uh, it's really just following on from uh, the last comments, uh, Donna and Peter. Um, uh, and to, I mean, first of all, to acknowledge the kind of work that historians have already done, just when you uh, get the focus really down to precious metals extraction. Um, uh, so uh, gold, uh, in South America, silver rather than gold. It's not that there wasn't any gold, but there's a lot more silver. Uh, and then um, platinum, uh, 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 particularly, um, all of that deeply involved in uh, uh, profoundly imperial histories, for one thing. But the kind of work historians can do, you know, if you if you follow out the anxieties and concerns about uh, mercurialism and artisan suffering from that, it might be. In, Potosi or, 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 or wherever. Uh, but there's a very good thesis, for instance, I think from University of Montreal 2016, uh, written in a very self-consciously environmentally analytical way. And uh, it's not to deny the mercurialism, uh, but to look in detail at uh, uh, what the mercury was used uh, along with and in processes involving and working out quantitatively that in fact um, it's the heavy metals that were the disaster for the environment rather than the mercury it was the lead above all the lead uh, uh, released in uh, vapors uh, 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 and and in other ways um, uh, so I just want to, I just really wanted to endorse Donna's thoughts about the extractive industries and and also you you the way you have to put mercury and gold and silver together because of the uh, the mercury amalgamation processes which are, I mean they're ancient they're from at least Roman times if if not before uh, and then transformed and transported uh, uh, for silver in South America. Uh, uh, so you have this interactive material history going on in 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 the extractive uh, uh, industries of the precious metals, and that's absolutely crucial. I think, yeah, you can't just do it with gold and mercury. You know, you've got to look at the interactions at the extractive and industrial and primary productive levels. I think in the first instance. So that's my my thoughts about it. Just to say really quickly something on that, uh, the highlighting gold and mercury was also the cause because it was Donna's main project with Yambix. So in our research, we also at least um, it's, it's a much more broader thing because when you think about like the German mining rush, it isn't thinkable with, without lead um, because lead made like the, the liquidation process possible and also massive amounts of lead were imported to the to the new world because they also did not only just did the amalgamation process but also no, um, smelt normal equation um, and so this is uh, we have to see the metals in interconnections yeah. and not just one but it's also good to start with one and also um, to have this highlight in our discussion now with gold and mercury 
yeah. have created a very inspiring um, discussion among us. And it's, um, yeah, we, we also think about these metals in connection in the cosmos. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Well, I unfortunately we're we're kind of out of time. Um, I mean, if there is a pressing question, I won't. I will still take it. Um, but I, I just have this feeling that we have to continue the conversation and maybe have another. Um, well, if you're up to it, have another session maybe at some point, just discussing the um, well, what what Donna was was calling environmental alchemy. Um, and or environmental history of alchemy that uh, that would be I think very interesting for for a lot of us, um, and I think uh, what what has come out of this 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 discussion is precisely uh, that we need to to uh, to root this this uh, our environmental crisis that we could um, perhaps go back and root it also in the. Uh, in the early modern period, uh, when there is, of course, this uh, this sudden explosion of interest, you know, in, on all these techniques and technology uh, that uh, has made possible where we are today. Uh, so, in terms of reflecting on on uh, on how much, um, I mean, what the influence of the early modern. Uh, um, let's say change of outlook has been on uh, on uh, today's today's uh, problems. Uh, this is uh, something that I've been thinking about actually in um, uh, in in my class. Is is that we have to think about this this change of mentality that is happening during this period and and what precisely the impact was not just. Uh, um, not just um, then, not just now, but also then. I mean, this 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 whole kind of log durée perspective could have some kind of uh, um, I don't know. Maybe it would it would help to help ground some of the debates today as well. Uh, but um, yeah, I mean, if you if you want to uh, have this again someday, maybe that would, that would be wonderful. Um, Otherwise, I, I want to thank you for, for these very inspiring talks and uh, all these wonderful things uh, that you brought to the table. Um, if you want to say anything at the end, uh, the, you, you'd be welcome to. Otherwise, we can uh, pick it up some other time or um, as, as you wish. Um, all, all I would like to add is that um, uh, we will have another session for this uh, early program uh, in three weeks' time. So it will be in uh, 8th of April rather than uh, uh, immediately, uh, not in two weeks, so in three weeks' time. Uh, and uh, then there will be a quite a different uh, approach. Um, uh, Arno Zimmern will uh, talk to us about his, his uh, VR project. Of, of creating an alchemical laboratory, uh, so of a virtual reality um, um, a representation. And uh, he will talk to us about the challenges of doing that. And, and um, he was telling me that there is, there is a lot of tricky things about fluid mechanics that he didn't realize would be important in things like uh, virtual reality recreation. Um, so thank you again, everyone. Um, Thank you for thank coming you, and thank you for all, all the all the comments. Yeah. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. And stay thank in you. touch. Thank, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>